Today's author, Peter Smith, he's Senior Vice President of Academic Strategies and Development for Kaplan Higher Education. He is also the former Assistant Director of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO. Dr. Smith holds a Doctor of Education from Harvard, and he led a successful effort to implement Vermont's community college system in the 1970s. In 1989, Peter Smith was elected as a representative from Vermont to the U House, U.S. House of Representatives. Today, he is here to discuss his newest book, Harnessing America's Wasted Talent, A New Ecology of Learning. As we celebrate our 20th anniversary at Snell Library, we are pleased to bring you today's program. Thank you. There, there we go, good. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about where this book came from and, um, and, and sort of what, what drove it and, and what it is it's about at a, at a 10,000 foot level and what it's not about. Uh, because it's easy for people to infer things and uh, it, we may end up seeing the world in different ways, which is one of the things that makes life interesting as far as I'm concerned, but I don't want it to be for uh, unintended reasons. So um, when I, <clears throat> I started in Vermont and I was the founding president and designer of what is now the Community College of Vermont in its 40th year, which gives you some idea, unfortunately, of my age. Um, and at the end of eight years, we had a non-campus, outcomes-based college with no permanent faculty working in rural areas uh, to serve underserved populations. And um, I had, at that point, I was about 31 and had an utterly unrealistic view of what I could and could not achieve in the world because the only thing I'd ever done <clears throat> had turned into this wonderful success. And so I assumed, soon to be disproven in other parts of my life, that. Uh, all I had to do was go out and try hard and everything would uh, turn, out, uh, turn out just fine. <clears throat> but from that, what I have retained is an unwavering belief in learning. And we all have a passion uh, if we're lucky enough to be able to identify it. And, it. and it took me a while to get it down to one word. But what I'm particularly passionate about is learning, about people's learning. And my experience has largely been with adults. And so it's adults learning. And I have spent the lion's share of my career, as it has been in education anyway, trying to understand um, how to create better learning environments for people, uh, uh, for adult learners. But I will say quickly that I believe, although there may be some changes in degree that I think much of what I have to say, I would argue, is equally relevant for people of other ages, i.e. younger college students. But that's not where my experience, the burden or bulk of my experience lies. And so it's not a place I'm as comfortable talking about. So what happened, when I went to UNESCO and I was the Assistant Director General for Education and spent the better part of three years traveling around the world, mostly in less developed countries, working with ministers, ministries, and international aid groups, trying to understand uh, what in the world you do in Sub-Saharan Africa or in the Asian subcontinent or in inland India or Malaysia when you, there's no prospect for having an infrastructure that will support learning the way we understand it in the West. There's just no, there's no prospect for training the teachers. Uh, study after study shows actual declines in the number of teachers available per, per child uh, because of a whole series of factors, but one of the most readily understandable because it happens in cities and in rural areas in the United States is that once you have a teaching degree, somebody else is going to pay you more. And in fact, we identified many, many people getting a teaching degree because of the degree they could get and then going off and doing something else for a living because they could make more money doing it. So whether you're talking about roads or schools or whatever it was, how are you going to get there? And it wasn't clear. And so I tried to talk uh, them into what I call leapfrog strategy, which would be to use the then emerging MIT open courseware uh, concept to, to think about being able to download, interpret, uh, but create education uh, from the sky as opposed to the other way around. And they wouldn't hear of it. Uh, and I understand that as a former community organizer, which is really what the Community College of Vermont was in the beginning. You're not going to talk people into something they don't want to do that doesn't make, meet a need. 
And <clears throat> what they said was, no, no, no. If that's such a good idea, go do it someplace else. If the way you do it is good enough for you, it's good enough for us. And so they continued, and, and I said, very understandable. Uh, so I got home, and it was the first time I'd been away from the United States for any period of time uh, working and out of the profession, if you will, away from American higher education. And that's when it struck me that as I'd been <coughs> looking at the, 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 the really Sisyphean task that uh, developing countries have, second and third as we would call world countries have, in developing systems like ours, being engaged in this uh, from a policy and political perspective, coming home and saying, my God, we are not any better as a system in the United States than we were 30 years ago. I mean, the, we have not figured out how to be more effective, i.e., educate a higher percentage of the population more effectively. If anything, we're sliding sideways or going backwards. The only group other that, 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 that is contra that are women, and we are doing, and women are doing a lot better uh, with us, and we are doing a lot better with women. Uh, but other than that, there has not been any appreciable um, change. A uh, couple of points here or there, but it's after millions or billions and billions of dollars, nothing's changed. And so that stimulated uh, this book. Uh, in the beginning, that was this, the stimulus was, why is this and what are the alternatives? Um, so what the book is about, and this is important, it is about what I call the middle third, and it's about adults. Now, uh, there are economists in the room, so I don't want you to get out your adding and subtracting machines and do algorithms. Uh, this, is, this is for the purposes of making points, okay? Like intellectual points, not other points. Essentially, if you look at our population, it breaks into three rough thirds. There is a third who do not have a high school diploma by age 30, uh, 23. Now, that may shock you. Uh, uh, if it does, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction because we do such a great job of masking the numbers. Um, and we always change the bottom end. And so 60% of high school graduates go on to college, but that's 60% of 68%. Um, of, um, so it's more like 40% of everybody, 43%. So, so there's a third that don't have a high school diploma. And then there's the top third or the first third who go and get some college and not all of them graduate uh, in six years, which is the way we count it now. Um, but they're people that we identify, they're people that we get our hands on. Then there's the middle third, uh, between 50 and 60 million people today who have a high school diploma, may have a couple of college courses, but generally haven't been to school. And that's who I'm interested in. And I don't push it off on the K-12 system, God knows they got a lot of work to do. They're trying to do it. But I think blaming them for, quote, unquote, the quality of people we get is like a doctor blaming a patient for being sick. Um, somehow, we have to understand that our job as educators is to take people where they are and, and help them figure out where they need to go and then be their, their companion on that journey. And I think it's something we are almost uniquely not set up to do with broad numbers of people. So that's... That's who it's about. And let me tell you why it's important, um, which would be a logical conclusion, but it goes to my motive and, if you will, aspiration for writing this and, and believing in it. And that is, there are, I say two things about having uh, more education than a high school diploma. Well, every time people say, well, we don't, we don't need to do much more, you know, uh, the Charles Murray argument, uh, there are other people that say, you know, there's a bell curve, and um, that's just the way it is, and we shouldn't feel too bad about the fact that two-thirds of all the people aren't, aren't going to get the goods. Well, here's what the goods are. The goods are, at a very rational level, we know absolutely the more education you have, the longer you live and the healthier you are, okay? The more you participate in civic and community activities, okay? The more you earn. Now, I don't need much more just proof than that. You know, if, unless we're interested in saying, we don't care if you live as long or figure out another way to live longer. It's okay for people not to be invested in their communities, relatively speaking. And it's okay if we consign people to a life of 12 or $15 an hour work in a world where that work is disappearing. I don't think that's acceptable. And I don't need much more data. I'm a, I'm a recovering politician. I plead guilty to that. Uh, I don't need much more information than that to think that what we are all involved in 
either as students, learners, or faculty, or administrators, is a noble and essential component of the American dream and of future American success as a society. To drill a little deeper, um, I believe, and I don't mean any pun by this, um, that we, we know that American democracy is what I'm going to call an elective activity. People don't have to participate. They don't have to. They participate because they feel some investment, and maybe in the upcoming days we'll find some disinvestment, in what's going on. And I don't want to get, in, get into that side of it, but, the, but when you think about it, this country is a great country not because of the separation of powers or the Bill of Rights or the Constitution. Those are sort of the skin and bones of democracy. They're important. They are brilliant documents. And I think the way we have handled them in general has is is, is been superb. But they don't make life in America. They create the possibility for certain kinds of life in America. What drives this country, I believe, is a promise of opportunity. The promise that things will be better for your children and their children than they were for you or for your parents. And the promise of opportunity it pulls people towards a positive future of their own making. If, in fact, as we look at the way this, the world is evolving, anybody can separate a quality of learning and education and the ability to know more, do more, be more reflective, be more powerful in our own lives. If anybody can separate that from being more powerful personally in the emerging social, economic, and civic world that we see coming, I would defy them to make that argument. I believe that education and continuing lifelong but higher education lies at the heart of hope. And I believe if we want this society to continue to invest in people having hope and giving the cause for that, that figuring out ways to understand the intelligence and the learning of more and more people who have been fundamentally disenfranchised lies at the heart of developing that promise and strengthening that promise. And so that's what got me, got me going on this. And I, I have heard nothing, nothing to, uh, to deter me from that, uh, if you will, more human and philosophical reason for doing this book. Now, let's, let me talk briefly about the nature of the problem that we face as a country. Some of you will know more about each of these points than I do. My, if I have a gift, it is to be able to look across a broad stream and connect a bunch of dots and try to see how different things impact, different movements, different trends impact each other and affect each other. Um, our workforce needs are being increasingly well documented. There are still doubters, but the latest study done by the Georgetown Center of Education in the Economy or Workforce Development by Tony Carnevale uh, illustrates it very, very clearly. And that is that we <clears throat> now have a gap of about 2 million high-skilled jobs looking for people to fill them, and they project that gap will be more like 6, six or 7 million in 10 to 15 years. Part of that's geographical dislocation. We haven't got the right people in the right place. Part of it is simply that we don't have uh, enough people trained to do the jobs. And the projections are <clears throat> that 65 to 70% of new jobs that are created, and that number may be a little low, it keeps sort of trending up, will require at least an associate degree or the equivalent. So in the face of that, our ability to educate people becomes, uh, if you will, an economic, a social, and a civic uh, priority simply because if we don't uh, in this global society and with the, in fact, uh, the globalization of corporate structures, uh, those jobs are going to go someplace else. Now, that's happened with woolen mills in Massachusetts going to South Carolina. You know, we can argue that that's no big deal. I think it's a big deal. I'll go back to the issue of opportunity, hope, and what, what's the glue that binds democracy together. <clears throat> and if we lose that glue, and if people say, doesn't matter what I do, I can't ever create a better life for myself, I think we've got a problem that is way bigger than some of the problems we're looking at uh, today. And so the, the need of the workforce, uh, for a workforce, um, really begins to, and, and, and President Obama has been very, very clear about this, uh, is, is critical. Now, let me put it in perspective. Um, 
our success rates basically are going sideways or down. Um, and so in that context, and I'm not, you can look at OECD studies, you can look at all those kinds of things. They're all sort of right and they're all sort of wrong. I will leave it to somebody else to get out the slide rule and figure out exactly how right or how wrong they are. But by the same measures, 15, 20 years ago, we were first, now we're 12th. Uh, and <clears throat> in fact, you're going to see people who are in the diaspora returning to places like India or uh, Serbia and working there because they can and they can make money and it's their home. Um, and so you're going to see all sorts of other things begin to, to play. But if we don't do something, and, and I think the thing that we're now beginning to grapple with is that when President Obama or the Lumina Foundation or the Gates Foundation or uh, some guy named Smith in his little book say you know, where, we need to, where we need to go, uh, we're not talking simply about taking all the kids at Northeastern and doing a better job of them all, and holding on to a few more of them and doing a good job with more of them. I think that's all part of it. Uh, but we're talking about 15 to 20 million people in today's numbers who we haven't figured out how to be successful with to begin with. You know, they are, we've got the low hanging fruit, if you want to put it that way, <coughs> sort of colloquial terms. We've got people who are, who, who are minimally or more than that equipped to do, to do learning in the institutions we created. The question becomes, what do you do with again as many people? That's about 18 million. So the long-term goal is to get successful, become successful with 18 million people again and again and again that we haven't been successful with historically. That is a, is a tall order. Here's why it's important. And this was one of those aha moments for me. I'm saying, how in the world, wh why, why is it important to do more than 30% or one third, to, to stick with my original law of thirds? Well, it was when I realized that China or India or Brazil doesn't have to beat us at our game. They can do it just the way we do it. And they can be just as successful as we are. And they swamp us by sheer numbers. 30% of 2 billion is a whole lot more than 30% of 400 million. So if we stand still and everybody else becomes more successful, somebody else can do the numbers, but it doesn't look good uh, for the United States. What we do well is invent. What we do well is create knowledge. What we do well takes, and we're, we're now reaping that, takes more education, takes more thought, takes more training. But that is, uh, I think, where our genius, if we have one, lies, is in the creation of things, of new ideas, of new applications, of new processes. And that's what we're called on to do again. Because we can't stand still at, th at, at, at one third. We have got to figure out how to get up towards 50% or two thirds of an educated population precisely so we can, can, can compete evenly, if you will, but also, if I go back to my earlier, more human point, uh, sustain our communities and uh, the promise uh, that we make uh, as a country to people who come here. Now, in this context, the, the nature of the problem we face is that the structure that we're surrounded with here we know who it works for, and we need it to do a better job, and we need it to do a better job with more people. But if you look at, I have a chapter in the book called Maxed Out. That was a nicer way of saying something other than the law of diminishing returns. But when you look at the soaring costs over the last 25 years of campus-based institutions, whether it's hidden through subsidies at community colleges, or whether it is right out there in front of everybody at private nonprofit colleges, um, the fact of the matter is that it has limits, and people are struggling to understand those limits, to evolve from them, to innovate from them, and we need all of that we can get. That's not what my book's about, because I honestly think that a research university that's really focusing on the whole game, it has a different mission. The one I'm particularly focused on is teaching and learning, and learning for these 18 million who have been fundamentally disenfranchised. Uh, uh, that's who I'm interested in. And so what I say is that the existing system is uh, a, a, a sleek running Jaguar. And I'm not talking about the car. Um, but we need to fly to the moon. And Jaguars don't fly. So it does us no good to get into comparative conversations about whether Western Governors University is better than Chicago State or 
Bunker Hill Community College. That, that is fundamentally beside the point. <laughs> the point is we've got to do better with twice as many people, half of whom we haven't figured out to how to succeed with yet. And so when you look at costs, you look at flat success rates, it is simply not wise or practical to expect the existing structure that we associate with higher education to solve all these problems, nor, nor do I think it is in the best interest of those institutions. Uh, it is, what we do need to do is understand what this emerging space looks like, who's going to do what, and how we're going to make the world safe for innovation, the way uh, it has been done several times in the past. Okay, now the nature of the opportunity that we face, I'm just talking about all the, all the problems, and I, if you want to talk more about them, I'd be happy to do it. It's, it's not my favorite thing to do. Uh, because I love institutions like this. I've been the president of a community college and of a state university and a dean, a graduate dean at a great private university, George Washington. So I, I'm heavily invested in this. Uh, and my critique is only to make that case, not to, not to make a negative case. Because without these institutions, all of the ones, the types I just described, we'd be nowhere. They are the, they're the maypole around which we dance. They're the foundation we build on. Build on. We don't get anywhere if our base goes sideways or down, becomes weaker. And we, we don't need to go from 16 or 18 million to 12 million. We need to go from 18 million to 38 million. So that's, that's my perspective. In, a, in the nature of the opportunity we face, and it's where I came up with the term a new ecology of learning, uh, where it got very interesting for me, both intellectually and practically, um, as I was uh, you know, creating, creating this book. Um, is, and I didn't invent the word ecology, obviously, and, and it turned out that all sorts of people have been using the term ecology uh, when they're describing um, Web 2.0 Plus and social networking now and all the things that are coming with it. That it, essentially what you have is a, a resource potential that was unimaginable 20 years ago, um, and, or it may have been imaginable 20 years ago by s some people. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have the ability now to bring resources to bear on learners of any age, anywhere, anytime with the right amount of support and guidance, uh, the right amount of conversation in blended or all online or hybrid varieties of ways. We can do that today. Can we do it um, and approximate the overall value of a great research university? Probably not. Uh, I think great research universities can do it and should do it. But if you're just focusing on teaching and learning, um, that is, uh, from my perspective, uh, now there is almost no limit to the, the opportunities and the potential we have to harness resources if learning is the point. If learning is the point. And I, let me give you an example. This sort of scares the pants off some people. I'd love to have a chance to try to do it. I'm not sure that I ever will. Um, but it, I've had the great honor of being involved with the MIT Open Courseware project from day one as a member of the External Advisory Council. I used to joke and say, it's 10 people you've heard of and then me. Uh, and when I looked, I was invited by Dr. Vest, and I looked at you know, all these John C. Lee Brown from the research, you know, Xerox Research Park, and oh, like George Schultz, you know, and, then, and then me. Um, but it was. It's just been a fascinating ride, and uh, then off to UNESCO and back, and seeing that the open education resource movement play out globally in Africa and places. And now there's a global consortium, of about 200, sorry, 250 institutions, 15,000 courses are online and free. Now they are a mixed blessing, and there are no grades, and there's no support, and there's no professor, but there's 15,000 courses online for free. Um, and a global consortium that is supporting those courses through Creative Commons, and it's, there it sits. 36 million different people downloaded at least one course last year. 36 million. Half of them, it turns out, are Americans, roughly, and of those, half are self-described self-learners, not who MIT thought they were going after in the beginning. Their big surprise, they thought it would be faculty and students at other colleges, high schools. People are saying, oh, I need physics. Good, that'll be a good physics course. That happened a lot, 50 to 55%. But 
But the big surprise was self-described self-learners, and of them, someplace in the neighborhood of half to 60% do not have a baccalaureate degree. Now, wow. You betcha. Wow. So all of a sudden, now look, one of the paradigms that are, are of, of, this is a, probably to scare the pants off here, of, of quality is, we think of Oxford, with endless lectures and resources, you are assigned a don, each don talks to 18 or 20 people, or maybe 12 to 14 people, and you, and you construct the learning out of that. You write, you, you choose interest. You can absolutely do that today in an online or blended environment where you find a, a gifted subject matter expert. You then develop 18 to 20 students around that interest. They engage in guided, independent, and guided group study. They listen to TED. They listen, they have the Library of Congress. They have 15,000 courses. They have Carnegie Mellon's courses, they have iTunes University's courses, and they have all sorts of other less clearly formed resources available to them. They have the hundreds of lectures a month that, there, I mean, there are whole streams now of world leaders and experts making lectures simply on a standalone basis. Oxford.edu. You know, it, it is absolutely doable for the right learners and the, with the right support. Um, that was not imaginable 15 or 20 years ago. And so what does that all mean? And this cuts to the nature of the problem we face in some ways and the nature of the opportunity that we face. We have entered the early stages of an era in which scarcity of information um, is gone. And we are entering an era of abundance. And it doesn't say it's all good or all bad. We all have examples of both. But let me tell you what it means to see uh, abundance instead of scarcity. And it runs across the board. The original argument for lectures was that there was one book. And that was after we decided to have professors or their, their predecessors stop being itinerant, go to a place, because there weren't many of them. So they'd go to one place, people would come to them. And there weren't many books, so they would read the book. And that was where lecturing came from. The whole economic and, and, prof and st academic structure of campuses of any kind are organized around the premise that you've got to collect scarce resources so that people can maximize their use. That, that would be other scholars, and it would also be learners. And then <clears throat> because you put them on a campus, you then limit the number of learners because there's a limit to the economics uh, of how many people you can put in every class. And the more famous you are, the more limiting you can be. So what you have is a model, organizationally, physically, and economically, that is organized around the relative scarcity of the goods and services, uh, the learning that it offers, or the research that it offers. I happen to still think it has more, more consistency today and validity for research um, than it may for teaching and learning. But that is, um, the, uh, that is scarcity. And, what Web 2.0 plus and social networking and the, the example that I've just used gives us is the opportunity to do something entirely different precisely because the resources that are available through those processes and through those inventions of American universities, by the way, uh, and make it un, an unlimited possibility. And let me take it two more steps. So the other thing, meritocracy something that I think we have honored occasionally uh, in the breach uh, in this country, but it is part of our cultural promise. And that is that the goods for society will be allocated to you based on your merit, not on where you were born or who you know or whatever. And that becomes, um, <clears throat> there's some people pretty cynical about it. I, I would only say on our good days, that's when we get it right, and then, then there are other days that aren't so good. Um, but think about it. We now have more jobs that need more education, chasing fewer students. And the whole point of meritocracy is that there isn't very much room up there, so we're going to make sure that the people who are most qualified get there. But now there's more room up there, and we aren't educating the people to occupy that space. 
So for the first time, the real significance of this age of abundance that we are entering is that it is incumbent on our, our schools and colleges to create merit, to actually fulfill merit, um, not to winnow people out, however deserving or undeserving they might be by whatever standard we use, but to create clear standards of quality and, if you will, bring people in. It's a fundamentally different stance towards learners and learning than the way most colleges and universities are organized or have been organized. And I make, it doesn't matter whether you accept one out of every 10 people or one out of every two people at, at all. Because I tried to talk about that earlier. That's great for them and for you, whatever it is. But when you're talking about going from 18 to 38 million with people who we have not succeeded with before, I would argue in a time where we need to create merit, and it's a little bit like the wellness movement as opposed to you know, illness uh, to hospitals or uh, emergency room care. It's like, let's help people be healthy. Uh, and, I, and I think we're struggling with an, whatever the analogy is for that um, in higher education right now. But the, I would argue that the opportunity we face is brought to, and that goes with the necessity, which is in the problem, the opportunity we face with the end of scarcity and the beginning of abundance is that we ha can only be seized if we begin to understand that our role is to create merit. It is actually to educate people who have, who have not been, we have not been successful with before. And I would submit to you that is a tall order. It is a much taller order, and there are very few people in the country that really know how to do it because our incentives, everything we do, are stacked in another direction or in conflicting directions. Yes, ma'am? So who do you think is doing it well? I, I would argue that different people are doing different things well. Um, I think right now we're, I mean, for instance, I'll take um, university, I'll take online learning because that's what I've, been enmeshed in. And by the way, when I, this isn't about Kaplan higher education at all. I'm, I'm working at Kaplan because when I came back from UNESCO and I'd worked in all these other institutions and I had been, you know, a, a bit of a risk taker and I looked, I had a couple of straight job opportunities as I called them and then I thought, I'm going to try this over here because I want to see if they're any better at embedding and sustaining good practice when it comes to teaching and learning. And I think the answer is, they are, they are good at it, they're not good enough at it. They will, we're, we're, I, we can compare ourselves favorably with all sorts of other institutions, but I think the comparisons miss the point. We need to figure out how to be successful, all of us, community colleges, state universities, I expect Northeastern already is, with more than 60% of the people who commit their time, their money, their hopes, and their dreams. We gotta figure out how to be successful with them. Um, but I think, for instance, University of Maryland, University College, um, has uh, 25 or 30,000 online students. Um, I think that's a great example of a traditional institution spinning off an independent institution that um, is making a, a real impact. I think uh, the Open University of, the, of England, UK, very, very uh, good. I think we're very good at what we do and I think we've just removed, uh, at Kaplan, and I think we've just removed a major impediment which I'm very proud of, which is we're now letting anybody who wants to enroll go to school um, free for the first 30 to 45 days. We have the right to ask them to leave if they're not doing the work. They have a right to leave if they don't think it's what they thought they were signing up for and there's no debt, no transcript, no nothing. Uh, and, then, and, and I think that's the kind of thing. I wish we would all get better at being able to predict clearly this middle third in terms of their, their, their inclination, and not their capacity, but their, their inclination to be successful. To me, that's the diagnostic we don't have. We, we predict educational success based on prior success right now. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally what we do. And, uh, until we can get better diagnostics, I would argue that what we have done <coughs> is ethically um, and educationally right, because what it does is let people try it without this pressure, this horrible financial and social pressure um, and just see, see how it works. So that's what we're doing. We started uh, doing it about a month ago and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. 
I don't think, I'm going to give you some examples of the new propositions. I don't think we're there yet. I don't, I don't, I, I've been at the WCET meeting and the EDUCAUSE meeting and around listening and speaking with uh, people and the, most of the effort today is aimed at um, uh, helping existing institutions do a better job. And I understand that. That's the dance we know how to do. And it's certainly the dance we know how to talk about. So political rhetoric on both sides of the aisle, wherever it comes from, knows how to engage in that conversation. Uh, I am, uh, I'll give you some examples. Um, again, you may, you may drive you nuts, but uh, of, new, of new possibilities. There's a, there's a business called Straighter Line. And if you want to Google it, it's straighterline.com, I guess. What this guy did, a guy named Burke Smith, no relation, um, he went to McGraw-Hill and he had them manufacture for him the 20 most highly subscribed lower division general education courses taught by all colleges and universities in America. Okay? English composition, accounting. I mean, the money courses. For anyone here who's watching the checkbook, they're the money courses. That's where you get 500 people and tell them big ideas and big concepts. Then he, and they're self-paced with tutoring, mentoring built in. He then went to one of the national accrediting groups supported by the Department of Education and they looked at the courses and said, these are good enough. Anybody who is offering an associate degree in one of our programs, somebody shows up with these courses you can accept them. They're, they're, these are good courses. He then went to the American Council on Education in one DuPont circle. It has the National Transfer Center, and which is the largest single repository of professor-reviewed courses offered outside of the campus structure. So military courses, corporate courses, et cetera. And they've set, the American Council set it up so they have teams of professors. They pay them. They review courses and then say, these are equivalent or they're not. And if somebody comes in and has passed this course while they were a soldier or worked for uh, Dean Witter or whatever it may be, we, we say it's good and it's up to you, college or university. You can do with it what you will, but we're telling you it's okay. And they said, these courses are good enough. So then what he did is he priced them at $499 for a 10-week course with all books, tutoring, mentoring, the whole thing, and said, if you take 10 weeks, it'll cost you that. But if you want to pay me 125 bucks a month, you think you can get it done in two months, I'll do it for 250. I'm making those, th those numbers are not accurate. That, that's a little low. So we had an entirely different tuition strategy. Okay? Well, when I read this in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I th it's about nine or 10 months, I went, holy moly. This is never happened before. This is not an institution of higher education. They don't hold themselves out to be an institution of higher education. They offer 20 courses. It's going to go to 30 and then 40. And they've priced it uh, in a way with tuition so that people can pay for it without getting financial aid. And if they think they can get at it quicker, they can pay less. And they're going right at where community colleges, private and public colleges make their money, which is highly subscribed lower division courses, and they've got these external agencies saying it's okay. Well, believe me, I can make a list of all the things that might be wrong with what I just described to you. My point is that how long did it take us to get reasonably good with community colleges? I mean, the community colleges have been around for a long time. They've begun to hit their stride, I believe, in the last 15 to 20 years in terms of really understanding where they fit, how they fit, what it means to do a great job. And they're beginning to develop expectations and consistent standards of expectations across that movement. Um, <clears throat> so this guy's been in business for a year, a year. And all I'm saying is, if there was one of him in early 2010, there's going to be three like that by the end of 2011, and there's going to be 10 in 2012. And all of a sudden, if we think a lot of colleges or future learning opportunities that we build in new ways, will be distinguished by the content or the professor. In more and more cases, that is simply not going to be the case. Now, I happen to think it may increase the value proposition for a place like Northeastern. 
Um, but for most people, it is the learning, the assessment, getting a valid and reliable, trusted credential. That's a, that's a big deal. And I'm not saying, I, you know, if you talk to employers, they, they don't trust most college credentials. Uh, they just, they don't trust them. Um, and I think they can make a good case for why they don't. Uh, but as we go forward, this, I don't think we quite know. And in the third part of the book, I don't talk about models because I, I think it's, I think there's going to be multiple models. I think the elements of the value proposition in higher education don't go away. You know, good content, good support, good teaching or learning support, coaching, however, whatever multiple forms that takes, good evaluation, trusted evaluation, good resources. But how they get bundled, I think, is going to change off campuses, going to change dramatically. And I don't think we can begin to anticipate all the different ways it's going to change um, because we're talking about entirely new potential. So what I say is that the, the, the new normal, uh, everyone's talking about the new normal, and they're talking about money. Uh, the new normal, I think, is a, a very rapidly being redefined higher ed space. And uh, I'm being sort of, I think of a rectangle, a line drawn from upper right to lower left, or however that, I don't know which way it's going for you, it would be the other way around. And below it is colored in black, and that's what we currently do. Okay? And then above it is white, and that's this new ecology. And somehow, we need to figure out how to fill out the whole rectangle be clear on mission, be clear on vision, be clear on the strengths and weaknesses of different types of institutions. Uh, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, uh, what we need to do is figure out how collectively to be successful with twice as many people and a much larger percentage of our population. So what are some of the, what will the new forms look like? Or what will their characteristics include? Learner and learning centered. I mean, this, again, drives some people crazy. But the fact of the matter is there is social networking and software learning platforms available today where students can do a lot, or potential students, lots of the work that we used to pay people and still do pay people to do in terms of organizing, assessing, uh, looking at uh, diagnostic tests for how their behavior relates to the area of study they want to go into. Um, those, I mean, all sorts of things. Uh, the Open University of UK has one called Open Learn, and I would recommend it to you if you're interested in these kinds of things. Uh, they serve tens of thousands of students a year, um, and it may be in the hundreds, for, for nothing. This is free, because it's the long tail. Once you build it, you know, the cost is renewing certain things. They, they recruit 10,000 students a year out of that. So what's in it for them? One, they're, they're doing a good thing. Two, they're getting 10,000 students a year who come to the Open University because they started in this playpen sandbox outside the front door and decided that they liked it. I think the role of assessment of learning at the course level and at the program level uh, in this new space is critical. If people don't trust the learning that has been done and, and that has been uh, validated, if you would, has been recognized, if we don't trust it, uh, it isn't it didn't going to be any good to anybody. And my approach to that is to create third-party assessments. Um, in other words, and, and I, I'm not planning to take this to the faculty of Northeastern, um, but uh, what I would argue is if you have 10 accounting courses and you, and you educate 300 people a year, at the end of the year you would have hire somebody to do a forensic ra random audit and try to figure out if the grading um, across those take 10% and, and did they give the same kind of general grade given the exams that were written and the papers that were written to try to figure out if there's consistency in standards. My own experience is that uh, there's a reason why nobody would want to do that um, and that's because there is no, not only no consistency, but there's no standard against which consistency would be, would be measured. And in, more importantly, it would be seen and perhaps legitimately, it's not the argument I'm here to make, as an invasion of uh, academic freedom in private professional space. I mean, that's, that is the nature of it and where great strength comes from. But having said that, for those of us who are out there trying to invent new ways to be successful with new people, it is absolutely essential that we can say it's worth it. You know, and so, and that's, so those are the kinds of things we're, we're working on is 
at the program level, employment rates, at the program level, um, the, the, the National Survey of Student Expectations, the CLA, Co Collegiate Learning Assessment Programs, uh, you may do some of this. And of course, a little bit I'm preaching to the choir because your historic commitment to experience in learning co-op ed is, um, is very well known and I think is uh, an enormous quality indicator for, for this institution from a point of view of having generating respect in the larger community. Um, so learner and learning centered. Assessment is quality assurance. Validity, validity, reliability, and consistency lead to trust. And so we have to find ways to link the assessment, one, to particular clusters of intellectual skills that we think are important, global awareness skills that we say are important, as well as professional or skill areas that are occupational. We can do that. We can do it. We know how to do it today. We just don't do it because it doesn't fit the model. But if somebody wants to fill up that new space in the new ecology, they're going to have to do it. Because if, if the outside world and the learner doesn't trust the learning they've done and the value of that learning, then in fact, uh, it, it's not going to work. And so I believe it absolutely can be done. And I think it's a very short turn. If you take the top 200 universities out of the equation in America, however we evaluate those, or 300 or 400, when you have an increasing number of institutions that can say to an employer, here's what our graduates know, here's what they're able to do, here's how they behave, here's where they work on teams, they are ready to be contributors to you because we've structured our curriculum to assess those things. I think that's going to be very valuable when you get beyond the idea of an extrinsic reputation that has been handed down over decades or centuries. Uh, I talked to you about the unbundled post-secondary education value proposition. I think we're going to see lots of different uh, ways of putting things together. And I think there are going to be, um, I saw something the other day called ONET, which is an Department of Labor, where they have every, every occupation in the United States, and they have skills, abilities, assessments about your behavior going, and you can actually research what you need to know. It'd be a very short move, and the American College of Testing has done the same thing. That's something called work keys. So for every occupation, by education level needed, you can see skills specific to that occupation or profession, and then you can see generic skills, teamwork, problem solving, writing, whatever it may be, that are needed. And so what you've got is the basis, and it's broken out by high school, associate, baccalaureate, and higher, to the extent that's uh, where you want to go. So I think there are going to be much clearer links to workplace standards, which I think will have the impact of holding employers more accountable, uh, as opposed to them just choosing who they like and saying, well, you know, I, I, I don't have anybody with the right standards. If you got a Cisco certificate, you're in pretty good shape. Imagine if we had a whole sector in higher education that was organized around something that had the, the perceived and real legitimacy of a Cisco certificate. That, to me, would be a very powerful, um, perhaps, alternative to accreditation. Um, and the, another one that may scare some of your pants off, but uh, what I call learner-interpreted degrees. If you want to be a nurse, there are things you've got to do to be a nurse. But a lot of adult learners have something they want to do, which is, would be more like a Bachelor of General Studies or a Bachelor of Liberal Studies or a Bachelor of Professional Studies. They want to craft their own program. These programs have been around for years, and at the master's level as well, in adult programs. But now there's the opportunity to say to people, you've been working in, I'm making this up, community mental health care. You now want to become the manager of a community mental health care facility. Come to us. We'll take a look at what you know. We'll figure out with you, using all these data sets, what somebody who's going to be a good manager of community mental health facility needs to know, assuming there's no licensure involved with it. And then we're going to help you get what you need to be good at that, using the work you're doing in the community mental health center as part of the laboratory work for this learning you're going to do. These kinds of things, they, 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 they contradict the sort of stacked knowledge of, uh, of assumption of a university's curriculum. And I'm not saying that the stacked you know, knowledge designed by the professoriate is bad. I'm simply saying it's not the whole cake. That it has its value, but there are other tremendous values out with new kinds of designs, and we ought to be friendly uh, to them. 
I think the greatest uh, return to where I started, and, and I'll, I'll let you go, or we can talk about it a little bit more. I really think uh, what is at stake here is the historic American promise of opportunity and, it, and the hope that it engenders. Um, that if we don't figure out how to be successful with people whom we have not historically been successful with, I think economically in terms of globalization, but right at home in our neighborhoods, uh, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Because a low voter rate is you know, forgetting if people try to depress the voting rate. That's, that's just something else. But if people simply say it doesn't matter, then we've got a disease um, in the heart of our democratic assumption that is a serious, serious disease. And I, um, I for one, think that the hope that education brings and the key that education represents to being socially, civically, and economically more powerful throughout your life, as well as healthier and more involved, um, is, is critical. What do we need? Uh, first, my assurance, somebody said, so the world as we know it, Western civilization as we know it, is collapsing. I said, not, not at all. Um, I don't believe it. I'm too inveterate an optimist to believe that. But what I, what I do think we need is room to innovate. And one of the searches I'm on is how can we go to an accreditor, in your case, the New England Association of Colleges and Schools, but wherever, and say, we're going to try something totally different. And we want three years to do it. We'll invest in it. We want your permission to do it. And at the end of two years, if it isn't working, we're going to fold it. And if it is working, we're going to do more of it. And we're going to put it in. Somehow, some way to legitimize the right to try something without risking your reputation, uh, to me, um, is very, very important when it comes to how do we use what we know about adaptive cognitive devices? How do we integrate that with the curriculum in effective ways that actually catch students and help them remediate at the point where they're not understanding something? Carnegie Mellon has really developed some remarkable data um, on how to do that. Uh, but it all comes down to the obstacles to implementing it beyond an experimental basis. Uh, so we need room to innovate. Um, and I think the great issue facing both the regulatory and the accrediting groups is how to be true to their mission and at the same time let us do, all of us do, what I think is one of the unique uh, Lee, wonderful things about this country, and I'm a great fan of de Tocqueville's writing, uh, that we're inventors. You know, we look at things and say, well, let's try it this way, let's try it that way. And I think in higher education, that's the opportunity we face now, is to not throw out what we've got, but to say, if we're going to fly to the moon, who's going to help us build the rocket ship? So, thank you very much for being here. You've been beyond patient. And, um, if you have any questions at all about anything, uh, I'm happy. It's all wonderful and it's all there, uh, but it's hard for students to use it and then say, oops, no credit, oops, no assessment. Right. Well, so I I'm think. I'm wondering, are countries bringing in ways to assess certain kinds of things that they will then impose upon students? I mean, what's happening? In well, the there are two ways. I don't know exactly what is happening. Globally, I was at an OECD meeting in Paris on this whole topic about a month ago. And I can assure you that there is an enormous amount of conversation. And what they're focusing on, the, the project, if you're interested in it, is called the AHELO, A-H-E-L-O, which is Higher Ed Learning Outcomes. I can't remember what the A stands for at this point. But it's a global project to try to look at learning outcomes. Um, and the idea is to be able to create a, 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 an agreed upon, if you will, net in which you can catch uh, and assess learning done in other places and ways. I think there are, I think you're going to see two things happen with, and we'll just take, or iTunes University, uh, or any of the other things that are coming. You're going to see services which work with students to collect the learning they've done, put them through exercises that help them describe what they believe they know as a result of that learning, whether it's open courseware or life experience, kind of portfolio. portfolio development, and then you're going to have independent third party experts, professors, and subject matter experts look at that with examples of what existing courses say they're going to teach, and you're going to see 
the presentation of a transcript, which then universities and colleges would decide whether or not to accept, how much of it to accept. Um, <clears throat> and I think what's going to come down there is it's going to be a lot of pressure, in some cases economically, but in other cases, just from the public, they're going to say, I know this, and unless you're willing to tell me to my face that I'm not a capable person, I'm going to take it personally if you're not going to accept this. And I think more and more colleges will do it. Um, you're aware of Kale, Kale Council for Assessment of Experiential Learning, 40 years old, 1,000 institutional members, principles of good practice. We know how to do this, and now we know how to do it online. So I think that's one. And then the other is uh, the example I gave um, of uh, Oxford.edu. I think I, I am not uh, myself, a to I'm not a guy who believes in self-paced learning uh, all by itself, with, you know, with, like no human interaction. I, not because it doesn't work, uh, because it does work for some people. And then when you add social networking, it turns out that the, the learning value for people, for, for learners, skyrockets when they talk to other learners as adults. I mean, the, the data is just off the charts. That's hard for those of us who run institutions <laughs> to accept, but it's true. Now, would it be true with graduate physics? Maybe not quite, quite as much so. But I believe that the role of faculty and subject matter experts as advisors, coaches, mentors, assessors, the, the, the magic in learning, to me, is learning how to reflect. It's when you go through the process of extracting or distilling how you've changed as a result of some learning you've done. So you have the mass of your experience in a Shakespeare course or living overseas for the first time or whatever it is. That's not learning, that's experience. But then some wise person helps you pull from that what it is, how you've changed, why you're different, how you're different, what you know that you didn't know before. When you learn how to reflect, that way, in a purposeful, analytic way, on your own experience, that makes you a lifelong learner. And my experience with adults who learn how to do that is they are unstoppable as, as future learners. Um, and so I see an enormous opportunity here for great and gifted teaching, some of it around content, but more than in the past, much more than in the past, around being an educator. About about being a person with standards and ability to assess learning in some consistent ways to get the most out of these highly capable adults in this case I'm talking about. I think it would be equally valid. I mean, look at uh, Olin. Look at the Olin experiment. What a, what a brilliant, simply brilliant thing. We bring in the, want to get the brightest kids in America, so we tell them they're going to design the school. Uh, and they did. And it's a great school. Um, so that's, there's, you know, you can rework this paradigm we have and get, I think, marvelous, marvelous learning out of it. I hope that that's helpful. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what do you think the biggest barrier, or what are the major barriers to that middle third? I think the, the greatest barrier to the middle third comes in two, comes from two directions. One is that we have, whether we like it or not, effectively socialized them with messages that started as early as kindergarten in some cases, but certainly the fourth and fifth grade, that this is not for you. So forget about it. In the book, I have a, I, have a, I won't be able to find it, so I won't try to do it. Uh, a guy named Bob DePrato. Uh, he's a um, policeman in New Jersey. And he's talking to me about going back to community college, the People's College. And it, it, the paraphrase is something like, so I've been to war. I've taking people out of burning buildings. I've been in shootouts with bad guys. And I'm walking towards this campus. My knees are shaking. I think I'm going to be physically ill. I could have gone there, flunked out, and no one would have known. And I'm about to puke. I'm so scared. Well, he didn't do any of that. He succeeded. And when I got up with him, he was in a, in a baccalaureate program uh, designed for adults. But how is it? that a perfectly capable person could believe that deeply that that institution wasn't for him. I mean, I, I don't want to dress it up with a lot of other stuff. I mean, I think we could get very deeply reflective about that. But how is it? So number one is we've got to understand that we have told them 
this ain't for you. Only, only really you know, capable people get to do this. I think the other thing is that we engage in practices in the traditional sector that are important to the traditional sector and may in fact help characterize it, but are very, very disrespectful to and, and injurious to learners. And I'll give you my, my favorite example. I have two favorite, that's four, two favorite examples. Um, the first is the assessment of learning that happens outside of school. Where is it written? that if I've raised children, read books on child development, run a daycare center, taught in a daycare center, uh, and I want to get a baccalaureate degree in child, degree in child development, that some, it would be bad for someone to sit with me and figure out what I actually know and what I actually need to know to qualify for a baccalaureate degree in child development. But we don't do that. We don't do it. We say, oh no, we know about this, you don't. Come in, sit down, we're going to start again. And a lot of people say, to heck with it, to heck with it. That's insulting. I don't have time to waste. That's a good way. One, one woman said in my book, well, I'll paraphrase it again, it's the lead into one of the chapters. She said, she said, if it's more money you want from us, then figure out some other way to scam it out of us. But don't waste my time, because time I don't have to waste. Now, so people leave. They just say, nah, 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 And the other is transfer. You know, the average student now, um, it's like, goes to 2.2 colleges. Like the average American is 52% female. So I haven't seen one of them recently. But the, the, the point, so I, beware of averages. But yeah, the fewer than 20% of all the people that go to college, first time freshman, 18 year old, graduate in four years from the college they enroll in. Fewer than 20%. See, so what you've got is a whole population that has migrated to an entirely different set of behaviors. Six years, seven years, two colleges, three colleges, multiple schools, rewrite the major, life changed, went away, came back, decided I wanted to be an accountant, not a lawyer. You know. and, then, and so what happens is that every time you shift program or take time off or shift colleges, you lose a minimum of a semester. Because when you come back, they say, oh no, sorry, you know, here at uh, you know, Sasquatch U, uh, you know, we have really high standards in our English program. And so that English that you took over at, uh, at Grizzly Bear College is just not going to be good enough. And so what you've done is just taken someplace between eight and $10,000 and a year or a term. It's, it's, it's actually between one and two terms and the lost earning potential and the time. I mean, and so people say, the hell with it. And we drive them away. Now, that is only a criticism if we say the existing accredited, regionally accredited institutions, the way they're structured, have to solve this whole problem. I, I understand why things are that way, and I understand when it is a conceit, and I understand, which is not a good thing, and when it is a reality and a necessity. I don't want someone nursing me um, who sort of learned it recreationally. I want to make sure they've been through. Maybe you can do it differently and better, and wouldn't be bad to educate more nurses. Last time I looked, we need a lot more good nurses. So there might be ways to do it better, but I'm not talking about licensure in that regard. I am talking about the simple transfer of academic credit. And where do you talk about abundance versus scarcity? Where did it become the practice that we're going to tell you, rather than giving you a chance, you took accounting 101 at BU, now you're over here at Northeastern or turn it around or change the names. And um, we're going to look at it and say, you, you can't do accounting 102, as opposed to letting you try or giving you a pretest or having some way to determine, let's, let's work on the potential and be an optimist as opposed to on the negative. Well, there are economics behind that decision. Let me, trust, let me tell you for sure, because every term is worth money. Um, and that is a habit we have grown into. Me too. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, when I was at Cal State Monterey Bay, you know, we were unfortunately busy doing much of the same. So it's, it's just the way the system operates, I think. And those are two examples. I could give you several more. And in the book, I talk about it as a cross-country road trip, where every time you get to a state border, um, they send you back 500 miles because you're not from that state. And so, and you're trying to go to California, to uh, create a new life. And some people get off in Oklahoma City and other people die in the desert. And, you know, and it's just a sort of you can't get there from here 
you know, that old main story. Those are two examples of what I call dangerous conceits um, that are historic to traditional higher education with some good reasoning behind it. I understand that utterly not helpful in solving the problem that the president has called us to face and that I think we have the resources to solve, which is how do you define capacity? How do you help people work to their capacity and, in, and deepen their capacity? And how do you know clearly what they've learned as a result of all that work. We know how to do that. And it's just behavior, custom. Organizational culture, big deal. I had, that happens to be my doctoral work, is in organizational culture. We, we consistently underestimate or ignore organizational culture. And the, the great American university is as resistant to this kind of change, that is its great weakness, it is also one of the reasons why it's one of the greatest institutions, if not the greatest institution in the history of higher education at doing what it does. So I don't want to dismantle it. I want to just let's let a thousand flowers bloom and, and create some new, new types of forms uh, elsewhere. And so nothing, I'm sorry, I get excited about this stuff. Any, uh, any other questions? I don't know enough about the DREAM Act um, other than Truly, I've been so busy, I'm embarrassed to say, as a recovering congressman, I should know about the DREAM Act. Um, my, my sense is, in general, I understand the politics behind it. Um, I would rather see more, still more money into Pell Grants. I would love to see us be able to use student loans for less than college degrees, which is a more expensive use. But we, we've got this whole financial aid thing set up so if you go one way, you get some, and if you go another way, you don't. And I think subdividing populations as opposed to putting more money on the table and then asking colleges to go after them, uh, it would just, I probably would have voted for it. Uh, but I would have been saying, this, this is a good thing, so I'm for it. But I think a better thing would be have a simpler financial aid policy that's more flexible, touches more people, and doesn't force, for instance, Somebody enrolls at our place or, or at this place, and they've, they're a part-time student, they've got a job, no, 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 and they need a loan. They can get the max. You can't control how much loan money they get, even if they don't need it. So this whole issue about debt is much more complicated than it appears. If I'm a half-time student, plus one course, so I'm eligible, whatever that equation is, I can, I can take the whole boat. And, and if I'm not making as much money as I wished I were, there are some incentives there to take more debt, not because you need it to go to school, but because you need it, or you think you need it. So I would, I would have tended to go into a, a, re, a simplification, rethinking, and calibration of financial aid so people could go to a community college for three courses, because that's what they need, and get the aid support they need, um, and that is, um, unless it's a good state program, that's very rarely the case. So I hope that's helpful. So see, I hope my face didn't get totally red there. Um, anything else? Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.